Okay, well, Wednesday is our midterm exam. And I know that I've announced this already before, but let's just review the situation. Um, on Blackboard, the exam will become available at 11.30 a.m. on Wednesday. And so that means that you'll have two hours to work on it since uh, you need to upload your files before 1.30 p.m. Uh, I think I emphasized before how important it is that you submit your work on time. Uh, if you miss that cutoff, and uh, you know, even if you were in the process of trying to upload your files at 1.29, but they don't finish uploading in time, I'm not going to accept them late. So uh, please uh, take that warning seriously and uh, leave yourself a few minutes to upload the files to Blackboard. Uh, it's a 50-minute test, which means 120 minutes should be more than enough, especially because I think that the fastest students in the class will probably finish the exam in about 20 or 25 minutes. Uh, now, of course, if you haven't been studying and you don't understand the material, then no amount of time is going to feel comfortable. Uh, but I don't think that most of the people hearing that right now are uh, in that position. You know, if, if you're in class right now and you're listening to this lecture, then I, I'm confident that you should feel um, well prepared for the test. You can use your textbook. You can refer to the lecture notes, both yours and also the ones that I've provided. You can use your previously solved homework assignments. And um, the restriction is that you shouldn't uh, use any external websites and you shouldn't communicate with other people. In other words, don't cheat on the test. I mean, um, if, you're, if it's something you're hiding and you know it's not right, chances are I don't want you to be doing it. So uh, what you submit should be your work. It should be what you figured out. So that's on Wednesday the 3rd of March. Now your next homework assignment, homework 6, which has to do with annual worth and it also has some additional practice problems maybe just one, on the future worth method. That's due on Monday, March 8th. And so if you look at the coverage of what's going to be included on the exam, it's going to be all of our lecture topics through uh, class 14. Um, but it's not going to include the lecture from Friday, which was annual worth analysis. I won't have an annual worth question on the exam. Uh, you should be prepared to solve a question with Microsoft Excel and um, in that case you'll need to upload your Excel file to Blackboard as well as your hand calculations for the test. So before we move on to talking about bonds and the course project assignment, are there any questions related to the exam that you'd like to ask? If you have any specific concept questions, and probably the most efficient thing to do is just get in touch with me on Teams or by telephone or email. Um, as you're studying, if anything comes up, I'd be glad to help. All right, so today we're going to spend about half the class meeting talking about bonds, which is a way that companies finance their expand and, and expand their growth and operations. And then we're also going to uh, cover a brief introduction on the project which I've posted on Blackboard and is available for you to read in its entirety. But let's get into some discussion about bonds. Now, a bond is a contract or a certificate between an investor and a borrower. And that agreement specifies how much interest is going to be paid and at what frequency. And then it also the contract specifies um, a lump sum redemption in the future. And so um, bonds are bought and sold on a secondary market and sometimes their purchase price can fluctuate over time depending on um, how stable an investment the company is perceived to be or maybe the purchase price of a bond can fluctuate simply because of market conditions. But at the initial sale there is a specified sales price and a specified interest rate that's paid for a bond. Yeah, that's Barry Bonds. And this is James Bond. But we're talking about a different kind of bonds. So here is a table of some bond values that I got a few semesters ago. And um, so what you'll often see when you're looking up bond prices is you'll look and find what's called the coupon rate. 
and there is the purchase price for the bond on the secondary market and then uh, based on those two factors a yield will be calculated. Now you'll notice the price most of these is around about uh, 100 and initially when these bonds were originated they were all sold for 100 but now on the secondary market several months or even years later the purchase price is different. So take for example this Wells Fargo. It originally the bond sold for a hundred dollars per bond and Wells Fargo was promising to pay 4.75 percent when they sold those bonds. And so what that means most bonds pay their interest on a quarterly basis but that's an annual interest rate and so what they would do Wells Fargo is they would pay four dollars and seventy five cents per year for each one hundred dollar contract that had been purchased and they would split it up into four payments and so uh, each quarter you're getting about a dollar nineteen in uh, in bond interest but when that originally sold for a hundred probably either Wells Fargo was in some financial trouble or the market was paying higher interest rates because now that bond is worth more. So it, it sold originally for a hundred dollars and now that bond is worth a hundred and thirteen dollars because people are very eager to receive four point seven five percent interest. I mean if you think about the kind of interest you earn on a savings account these days it's like point three point four percent and so a relatively stable investment that pays 4.75 percent that sounds fantastic but if you buy that bond for hundred and thirteen dollars you're not actually going to receive 4.75 percent interest you'd only receive a yield of uh, 1.77 percent interest because what you've done is you've paid more for the bond than its redemption price in the future at the end of the bonds life they're going to give back the original amount. They'll give back the original $100 per bond. And so what you would have received along the way would have been the periodic interest payments and then a lump sum return of your original purchase price. And so when you factor those two things together, the interest that you're receiving over time and the price that was paid, if you buy a bond for $113, and it's only going to pay back in the future a hundred then that reduces the yield on the bond below the coupon which is the rate at which the bond issuer pays interest this is a little bit complicated for now but look at the Merrill Lynch bond right now the coupon and the yield are the same because this price of 100 is the same thing it, it, that's the initial purchase price and that's the current, the current market value as well so if the purchase price is higher than the original price, you know, if, if on the secondary market you have to pay more than 100, that drives the yield down. But then look at a few cases like this Chesapeake Energy. Chesapeake Energy wasn't doing very well, uh, and it still may not be doing well. Um, there was a glut of hydrocarbons on the market. Too many companies did fracking, and there was just more natural gas than the market needed and so energy companies like Chesapeake suddenly found themselves um, a lot less profitable than they used to be and so Chesapeake looked and in fact it may have gone out of business I don't remember if it's gone bankrupt they've been having financial troubles but when I grabbed this data online uh, they were paying 5.75 percent interest but it had a yield of 30 percent because to, to buy a bond you only needed to pay 61 dollars on the secondary market so you're paying 61 and you're getting every year five dollars and seventy five cents of interest and then in the future the lump sum payment is going to be a hundred dollars and that, all that of course is as long as they still stay in business so the trend in pricing data down here at the bottom the trend is if the secondary market price is above 100 then that makes the yield go lower and if it's below 100 that makes the yield go higher so we'll talk more about yield uh, in a minute before we get any further though uh, let's talk more about what you get when you purchase a bond 
you give a company some money now, you give them $100 now, and they promise to pay you back in two different ways. They promise to pay you back in periodic interest and as a lump sum at the end of the bond's life. And so the periodic interest, R times Z, R stands for the rate that the bond is paying, and then Z is the, um, the face value of the bond. That's how much you paid to buy it. So if it was a 4% rate and a $100 bond, then that means R times Z is $4 of interest per year. So you're gonna, if you buy a bond, you're going to get interest payments coming to you, and quarterly is the most common. Sometimes some bonds pay annually, some bonds pay monthly, but most pay quarterly, meaning every three months. Then the other part of a bond's value is a lump sum when it's retired. And so this formula allows you to determine what is the current value of a bond. And so if you look at this formula, what it's saying is that the current value of a bond is the discounted value of its eventual redemption price. And so that's this first part is we're saying we want to find out this lump sum C in the future that you're going to have. So that's a future value and you want to find out the present equivalent of that. And you're discounting that at I, which is the yield rate that you hope to achieve. So if you're trying to figure out how much you should be willing to pay for a bond, you first have to determine what is the yield rate that you want to achieve with that bond. The second component of a bond's value is the uh, present value of recurring interest payments. And so you'll notice here the factor P slash A. That's how you find the present value of a uniform annual series. And that's what interest payments are, is it's a constant equal amount and there's no gap, gaps in between. It's just periodic interest payments coming to you every quarter. And so you want to find out the present value of that when you discount it at the yield rate. So in this whole equation, there's two different rates. There's R, which is the rate that the company is paying interest, and I is the yield rate that you hope to achieve. So remember back to this earlier table, there was two different types of percentages. There's the coupon, which the company pays, and then the effective interest rate that you see is the yield, and that's determined partly by the interest that's paid by the company, but also by the purchase price that you pay for a bond. Okay, so this is the formula that we're going to use in today's in-class exercise just to get some initial practice with pricing bonds, and we're going to also reinforce this in the lecture that we have on Friday. We'll continue talking about bonds a little bit um, you know, throughout the semester, just because uh, I, I've, uh, I've noticed that this is a complicated subject and students need a little bit of practice to feel comfortable with it. All right, so here's the in-class exercise for today. And uh, just as a starting point, I think it's useful to get practice in um, deciphering the problem statement and assigning labels here. So this is the paper I hope you've got printed out. And what we're going to do is um, it's a 10-year bond and it pays 6% interest per year payable semi-annually. And so this particular bond pays interest every six months. So that means that there are two payments per annual year, per year. So if it's a 10-year bond, then there's going to be 20 interest payments. And then at the end of 20 periods, then you get a lump sum of $1,000. And so what we're going to do is we're going to use this formula to find out what should you be willing to pay for the bond if you want to achieve an 8% yield. So remember I said that there's two different rates. There's the rate that the bond is paying interest. When that, this, the, the rate that the, the bond is paying interest is determined by the the person who issues it, meaning the company that's borrowing money. And then the yield is uh, determined by, in, in essence, by the buyer, because you're willing to buy the bond at a certain price, and that's what finalizes what the yield rate is. 
Okay, so I'm going to pause for a moment and give you a chance, first of all, fill in these blanks and notice what I've put in bold. So take a moment to fill in the blanks and then use the factor table that follows below. Here's the factor table for 4%. You're going to need the 4% table, and that's a hint, um, in order to find the V sub n for this bond. All right. So I'll pause for a second. I'm not going to put you into the, uh, the breakout rooms this time. We're going to try and keep this one quick so that I preserve as much time as possible for the project description. OK, let's take a moment to uh, discuss what are the blanks that you should fill in here. OK, so first of all, N, number of periods before redemption. If it's a 10-year bond, but it's payable semi-annually, then that means that there are 20 periods before redemption. So you need to write 20 in the blank there. Bond rate per period. OK, so the bond's rate is 6% per year, but there are two periods in each year. And so the rate is 3%. And so what you should fill in the blank for R is 0 0.03. Similar thing applies for the yield rate per period. If it says that the yield rate is 8% per year, and we have two periods in a year, then that means that the yield rate should be 0 0.04. C, the redemption price is $1,000 because it says it's redeemable at its face value. So this statement says that the face value Z is 1,000 and also the redemption price is 1,000. So they're both 1,000. Okay, now look at the formula. R times Z is going to be how much interest gets paid during each period. And so if the bond rate is 0 0.03 and Z is 1,000, then that means that there's going to be $30 of interest that you get every six months. And so R times Z, R 0.03, Z is 1,000. So R times Z is 30. So what we do with the P slash A factor is we find out the present equivalent of 20 payments of $30. Now R, remember, was 0.03 and I is 0.04, which is why I've given you the 4% factor table. Because you need to find out when you're discounting those recurring $30 payments to the present at 4%, then this is the table we're going to use. And so P slash A means uh, it is this present worth column. And we need to go down to row 20, because N equals 20. So P slash A row 20 is 13.5903. All right. So when we look at the solution, it's going to be 13.5903 times this, which is essentially $30. So the present value of the interest payments is $407.71. And then the first part of this formula finds out the present value of the lump sum. So the lump sum we're discounting using a P slash F factor. So P slash F is the present worth column. N equals 20, because that $1,000 payment is 20, year, uh, 20 periods in the future. So the factor then is 0 0.4564. So 0 0.4564 times the value of the lump sum, which is $1,000. And in present terms, that means that the present value of that lump sum is $456. So we combine the two parts together. And what this all works out to mean is that if you pay $864.11 for the bond right now, then you're going to be achieving a yield rate of 8% per year, even though 
the company only is paying 6% interest every year, you get a yield rate of 8% per year because you paid less than the face value for the bond. Now, you know, whether you can actually buy that bond for $864 is a different story. Maybe someone on the secondary market is willing to make that sale. Maybe they won't. It could depend on the company and how their business is doing. It could depend on interest rates throughout the environment, how the economy it, as a whole is doing. But uh, this is our first try at these uh, substitutions in the bond valuing equation. So are there any questions about that before we move on? I'd say that this is one of the things that students struggle the most with in the whole semester. Um, you know, you'll have bond questions on exams, although it's not going to be on the first exam. But it'll be on the second exam and the final, and uh, students really seem to struggle with this. And so if, if you don't understand it, read through the book, uh, try working through the in-class exercises again, um, you know, discuss it with a colleague, give me a call. There's lots of different ways that you can under figure out how to do these bond calculations, and it's important to get it right before the test comes around. Okay, so uh, that's it for the in-class exercise. Now let's talk about the project for the semester. It's important. It's worth 15% of your course grade. So if you do well on the project, it could raise your average. And if you do poorly on the project, or worse yet, if you don't even turn it in, it, it could definitely sink your grade for the whole semester. So you have some opportunity here. Oh, that's not the right due date. Friday, November 20th. That was last semester. This semester it's due on Wednesday and uh, April 21st. All right. Now you're going to turn in a, a PDF file, which is a, a written report, and then also a spreadsheet that has your calculations for the project. And um, I've posted the assignment description on Blackboard. And you can see here in bold and all caps, I'm asking you to read it. And I even suggest you should read it more than once. You should read it several times before you begin working. Um, and that warning I'm given to students because uh, too often people start on the project without really understanding what they need to be doing. And they spend a lot of time feeling confused uh, and doing work that isn't needed and forgetting about work that is required. So take a moment to read the project description. Here it is. Here's our, our class page. And at the very bottom is the project. And if you click on that, it'll pull up the PDF file. Let me open that. And we'll look at it together, just so you get an idea of this assignment description. All right, here it is. So you see it's due at 1 PM. Oh, that's weird. I should have made it 12. <laughs> OK, well, 1 PM it is. 1 PM on Wednesday, April 21st. Um, and the assignment description is four pages long because I give you a lot of hints, like ways to make this project easier. So it, if you read the assignment description in its entirety, although it may maybe take you a few minutes to read these four pages, it's going to save you hours because um, I've given this project probably 15 times now. And uh, I keep fine-tuning the assignment description a little bit each semester to make it uh, more clear. And when students make mistakes, I try and give them hints on how to avoid those mistakes. So read through this in its entirety. But let me just give you an overview today. And hopefully that will be a good starting point. The uh, project is about your money. And I think that will be an interesting and exciting topic for everyone because uh, there's no subject that's more interesting than one's own self. Like there's nothing that interests you more than you. And that's true of everybody. And so what you're going to be doing is you're going to be thinking about your career and your future. The whole reason that you've come to school while you're uh, taking classes and spending all the time and the money is because you're hoping that all of that effort and education is going to make a good paying and stable career available to you. And you'll get money for the work that you do. 
And so think about your cash flow over time. You're going to have a place, uh, whether it's a wallet or a savings account or a lot of different places, meaning you know you put some of your money in your wallet, some of it in a savings account, some of your assets are going to be in stocks and bonds. You may someday buy a home. But the point is you can add all of that up and you have some total amount of money. And here I'm um, expressing that just kind of as an illustration as a tank and there's liquid in that tank and how much liquid is in the tank is representative of your assets. And so the money comes in and if you have low expenses then your assets will grow. If income is larger than expenses then the liquid level meaning the amount of money you have in your accounts gets bigger and bigger over time. And that's what you want to be doing is you want to be building wealth and building assets so that when you get into retirement, you have enough to get by because you'll be making less money in retirement when you no longer work. So I'm going to ask you in this project to think in the future, what's your income likely to be? What kind of a job do you have in mind? What, what is the pay structure like for a fresh graduate? What is the pay like when you've been in the career for five or six years or you know, in the end of your career when you're about ready to retire? What might you be making then? And of course, you'll be able to account for the changing value of money over time, uh, inflation, you know, um, and also cost of living adjustments. And so each year is going to have its own row on a summary table that I'll ask you to make. And for each year of your career, you're going to estimate what would your income be that year and what would be your expenses that year. And after uh, the regular expenses, you also have to account for extraordinary expenses, like um, maybe you're going to get married and it's going to be a big expensive wedding. Or maybe you're going to buy a home someday or an RV or a boat and you're going to have a big lump sum deduction from your assets when you do any of those extraordinary expense type things. So we want to find out how your cumulative savings balance changes over time throughout your career as you continue to add money to your assets and continue, continue to squirrel away funds into the uh, 401k and a Roth IRA. Maybe you'll be saving for your kids um, college expenses in what's called a 529 plan or an educational ESA. But in addition to your savings, there's also this beautiful thing, interest. And so uh, you also need to account for what kind of rate of return are you going to be making on the stocks and the bonds and the savings accounts that you've lined up. Um, your balance itself will be generating additional funds due to compound interest. And so over time, we want to track all of these things. We want to find out how your financial situation looks throughout the career. And so the project has several phases and the report that you're going to write mirrors these same phases. The report that you're going to write starts off with an assessment of how much income you're going to make due to working. And so you need to figure out just as a hypothetical what's a likely career that you would be pursuing. And so if you are, for example, a, an electrical engineer, maybe you'd think, I want to work for the power company. I want to work at AEP. And so you could go to a variety of different sources to find out a typical starting salary at a place like AEP. You could go to a website like Glassdoor, where uh, people who work at a company fill in data on the website. You might go to AEP itself and maybe they publish their starting salary in some open position announcements. Or you might know somebody who works for the particular company and so you could get the data from the person you know and, uh, and work it out that way. So there's a lot of different ways you can uh, assess what your income is likely to be. But you don't need to just focus on the first year that you enter the profession but also you need to think about how it's going to change over time. So you'll make an assumption of your cost of living adjustments and so in year two you'll probably make more than you did in year one just because most companies give a little bit more each year so that the salary keeps pace with inflation. Um, 
And in addition to those cost of living adjustments, you may also get promotions. And you know, where you have a sudden increase in your work responsibilities, or maybe you're more profitable as an employee once you get your PE license. And so you're getting a higher salary then. So the first part of the project is to assess your income. The next pro part of the project is, uh, is focusing on expenses. Now, you notice I didn't write budget because what I don't want you to do is I don't want you to say, well, I'm going to allocate $100 for cell phone. Uh, I'm going to allocate uh, $700 for rent and $200 for other utilities. It, you know, this is not a budgeting exercise where you're just figuring out how much you're allowed to spend in each category. It, this is the opposite of that. This is, I want to know the specific things that you're going to spend money on. And so you're going to have food expenses. Go to a grocery store and figure out what would you actually buy in a week. And what is the cost of those items for a week of groceries. Find out if you think you're going to be living and working in Charleston, West Virginia, find a specific apartment and say, this is the one I'd move into today and here's the rent. And for this property, um, you know, this is how much it would cost me on an annual basis. And then, you know, if that property includes utilities, then you wouldn't have to uh, add that on top of it. But if it doesn't, then I want you to find out in Charleston how much is the water, the sewer, how much electricity are you likely to use. And so um, the regular expenses part of the project is an assessment of what you're likely to spend based on you know, your, your tastes in some in some ways, you know, because some people will want to spend a lot of money on clothes or going out, eating in restaurants. Other people, their expenses may be focused mainly on uh, like a hobby. Maybe they want to be buying lots of expensive bows or something. The extraordinary expenses is those one-time or rare events that don't happen every year, but like having a kid or planning a wedding or a once in a lifetime type vacation. In section four of the project you need to assess your retirement expenses and um, the reason why it's separate is that your living standards and how you spend your time is likely to be dramatically different once you're no longer working. A lot of people will uh, travel more, they'll go golfing more, or buy a big RV, and so I just like to understand how you anticipate spending that time uh, after your career and therefore the expenses that will go along with it. Section five is the investment section and that's where you do some research on stocks that you think you'd buy or mutual funds you'd invest in or bank accounts that you would put some of your funds into and you need to come up with a weighted rate of return. And so if you're going to be putting some of your money into stocks, some of it into bonds, some of it into a savings account, you determine a likely rate of return for each of those subcategories, and then you come up with a weighted rate of return. And then it's that rate of return that you're going to use in your spreadsheet calculations where you're finding out the compound interest of the, uh, of the savings and your assets as they accumulate over time. And so section six is where you calculate and kind of show with a graph how your cumulative savings balance is going up over time. And then section seven is the supporting references um, where earlier in the report you are going to make a citation to outside information sources. So you should use the author date method of citation. So if you found like a website, glassdoor.com, and that's where you found some salary data, then you'd mention it in section one. And then you put the full reference, including the link, the date access, the particular page, the author who wrote that website page, if that's known. You put all that information in the references. Now this is kind of the heart of the project. And this is where you're communicating all of the information that you've gathered and all the assumptions that you've made. And so here's just a hypothetical illustration of someone who was 23 years old when they started their career in 2018. Let's just say that the person's uh, gross annual salary is $37,000 per year in that first year. 
Chad's asking if anyone else's screen black. Refresh, it worked. You may need to refresh your screen. Mitchell says his is not black. Jonathan's was black, and then he rejoined. So if you can't see the uh, spreadsheet right now, maybe just uh, refresh. OK, everybody's saying refresh worked. Thank you. OK, so I'm showing this is a spreadsheet that you should make. And you should include uh, in the body of your report. And also, you're going to provide the Excel file that generates this as well. But column C is the income for a given year. And so in the first year of this person's career, they made $37,000. And then the, the total of their expenses was $20,000. So somewhere else in the report, they're going to tell me all of the things that goes into their expenses. And so that expenses includes their portion of the health insurance, income taxes, property taxes, rent, water, sewer, gas, electricity, trash, cable, cell phones. I mean, just all of the things that go into expenses are lumped together. And I can read about like where did this number come from in the body of the report. But for this particular year, this person's expenses were 20000 And so by definition, what we're saying is that the amount you save, so here, column F, how much you save is the difference between your income and your expenses. I mean, that by definition, if you didn't spend it, then you still have it. So the, uh, the savings is income minus expenses. Now, if you didn't have any savings before, then you're not going to have any prior balance. And so you're not going to earn any interest yet in the first year. And so the cumulative savings balance in the first year might just be the 17000 that you contributed this first year. Maybe you already have some savings. Um, you know, If you get through college with no debt and some savings, then congratulations. That's going to be great. But what you could do to make the spreadsheet reflect that is just have your cumulative savings balance be what actually you have right now plus the amount that was saved this year. But I think for many of you, you'll be starting with zero savings. And so in the first year, the cumulative savings balance will just be how much you saved in that first year. OK, now look at the second year. So in 2019, this person's making a higher salary because you know, they're more useful to the company, so they got a raise. Their expenses went up, as they are likely to do due to inflation. And so the amount saved was the income minus the expenses. And so in the second year, saved 21500 Now look at this column G, investment yield. What the investment yield is, is the $17,000 from last year, that's going to earn interest. You don't earn interest in how much you save this year. This interest amount is based on the prior year's cumulative savings balance. And so if you've got a calculator handy, hopefully you do, with your calculator, multiply 0 .055. So that's the rate of return. Like this person is putting some money in stocks some money in bonds, some money into mutual funds, and so on. And so they've come up with an average rate of return for all of their investments is 5.5%. So 0 0.055 times 17,000, 17, So that's where this number comes from. 935 is the interest that you earned on last year's balance. And so now this cumulative savings balance at the end of the second year, 39,435 is last year's balance, 17,000, plus how much new was saved this year, 21,500. So that takes us up to what? 38,500 plus this interest yield of 935. And so 
39,435 is the, the cell above it and the two cells to the left of it. Because how much you have at the end of this year, like how much is in your account, the amount in your account is last year's balance plus how much new money you put in this year and the interest you earned based on last year's balance. Okay, so if you go through this, you'll notice that every year the income's a little bit higher. Sometimes it's like a uh, like an even number, like the 37,000 to the 42,000. In the report, what I would read from this person is that that bump in salary is because they got a, a merit raise. They're more useful to the company, they have more experience, and so their salary went up. But then some of these aren't those nice round numbers, like it is based on a cost of living adjustment. Going from 50,000 to 65, they're applying a certain percentage cost of living adjustment each year to get to the next salary level. So some of them are just based on cost of living adjustments. Other times, look where it goes from 60,000 to 75. Probably this person assumed that after 11, 12 years of experience, now they're in a supervisory role. So they got a, um, a promotion and a pay raise because of that. So you're going to be doing, oh, here it is, down here in the notes. Big promotion assumed in year 2030. 3% cost of living adjustment assumed for years 2021 and beyond. So here in the notes, we can see some of the details that explain how the values are going up. Year 2022, car. So here's, they're going to pay cash for a car. Rather than going to the bank, they're just going to use some of their cumulative savings to buy the car. All right. Marriage in year 2025. Okay, so this person's going to spend $55,000 on a big fancy wedding. That seems expensive. Um, in the past, people have asked me, well, I don't think I'll get married. How should I make the project reflect that? And I want the project to be an accurate reflection of your life. But I also want it to be conservative. And by conservative, what I mean is like from a financial standpoint, worst case scenario. So uh, worst case scenario is that you have lots of dependents. And so you want to, to make sure that you've got enough money saved, right? So you want to, you know, if you're choosing between apartments, you know, Assume that you choose the more expensive apartment. Um, and it, the conservative approach on rate of returns is assume that maybe you're not going to make a spectacular rate of return, but assume that you're going to make a typical or maybe even a little bit less than a typical rate of return. So you've got to be prepared for the more expensive thing that could occur. And so if you're not sure if you're going to get married, then just plan for it you know, that you'll have another dependent and your expenses are going to be higher because of that. And then if you end up not getting married or having kids, then you'll end up having more money than you, anti than you originally anticipated. But um, what I don't like to see is some students think they're going to like outsmart the system by saying, well, just to simplify the project, I'm going to assume I put all of my money into a checking account and that makes no interest. So therefore, now I don't even have to do the investment section of the project. Well, nobody actually does that. Nobody puts all of their money into a checking account. In fact, your employer won't allow it. All, like, all state employees are required to have a retirement plan. And the same thing is true at most companies, that they're going to kind of uh, not give you the option of whether or not to participate in the 401k or the 403b or whatever their retirement scheme is. So. Um, Try and make this as realistic as possible and reflect your actual interests and the, um, the career that you think that you may have sometime. And Travis asks, exactly how long do you want us to go later in life? Do you want a 20-year plan or a 30-year plan? I suggest that you take it through the entirety of your life. So, you know, the average life expectancy, I think, is in the United States like 78 or something. Take it through age 78. Or if you think you're going to be healthy and live to 90, take it through age 90. Um, so I mean, it seems a little bit morbid to be thinking about one's eventual death, but 
really you're doing yourself a favor if you right now while you're young plan for the fact that you're going to live a long life and you want to make sure that you have enough money for all of it. The last thing you want to do is run out of money and have to go back to work when you'd rather be sitting in front of the couch, uh, sitting on the couch in front of the TV or you know whatever your hobbies and interests are. You don't want to be working uh, if you don't need to. Okay, so let me show you an example from a student just so you can get an idea of what an A looks like. Not everybody's going to get the same grade on this project. You know, there's no one right answer for this project. Like, how long does it need to be? There, there isn't an exact length uh, requirement for this project. You assume that you survive dynamics. Yes, that's the, uh, the optimist, right? Fire truck going by. Um, so this person assumed that they were going to work over at the Army Corps of Engineers, and so they went to the published salaries for that. You know, you can look up online the uh, the salary data for the Army Corps of Engineers, and they went through how it's going to change over time and the assumptions with promotions and so on. Here's a figure that kind of illustrates the uh, uh, the pay data that federal employees have and. Here is the citation for that. Section two is the regular expenses, and so they talk about their health insurance and uh, the inflation that's going to apply for expenses and taxes. This student talks about the car that he wants to drive and fuel costs and maintenance for vehicles and food costs, just all of the things like, uh, you know, your parents can give you an idea of where they spend money if if you've never lived on your own and managed like an entire budget then you can you know talk to someone who has those real world expenses and uh, get an idea of the categories do not necessarily the amounts what i don't want to see in this project is don't say well my mom said the electric bill is so much every month and the sewer bill is so much every month don't just like make your parents ex expenses be the basis of your entire report I mean, it's, it's fine to have them tell you the categories, but not the amounts. So um, in the end, this person made a graph of their assets going up, and then they retire and stop working. This person, I think, bought a huge expensive RV, and then the assets keep changing again. Well, we're out of time, so we'll continue talking about the project in the future, but I would uh, encourage you to read through the assignment description, which is available now on Blackboard. Now, just remember, we won't have class on Wednesday. On Wednesday, we're going to have the exam. So you'll find the exam at 11.30 on Blackboard. And if you have any questions between now and then, please let me know. That's it for today, everybody. Hope you have a good day.